Hey, this is Alex Head, founder of Subtext Radio. This is Subtext. Please go ahead and click the like button and the subscribe button. It really helps us to reach new audiences and promote the artists that we work with. Hit like and hit subscribe. Thanks, Subtext Radio, for featuring this excerpt of a talk given by Siling Yang and myself, Anna Kostriva. It's about a conceptual architecture project called Einstein Tomb by Lebius Woods. The full presentation with images can be found on the YouTube channel, OWMF Architecture. So this project is by Lebius Woods, and you can see his drawings are somewhat like that. He doesn't, he doesn't build a lot, but uh, they're all conceptual projects. Uh, basically, he's very interested in experimental space and in one of the lectures he said these are the spaces in which you don't already know how to behave so the example that he gave is like well if i name this space like classroom or it's 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 made like four walls with chairs and blackboard right then you will kind of know how to behave so his definition of experimental space is like uh, spaces that you don't know what it's for and you don't really know how to be yourself in that kind of space, right? So exactly in this spirit, right, that he designed and science to, right? So uh, you can read his blog as well, right? So to him, this is also the task of uh, an architect, right, to take us to places and spaces that we have never been before, right? So this is equivalent in science, like the exploration of the outer space. Right, so we've got a few pages of text it probably would take me a bit over five minutes to read through so you get a clear understanding of what Lewis Woods was thinking for Einstein's tomb. And they're written sort of in a verse and put next to several line images or prints of his work. Um, so I'll just get started. Einstein tomb, Lewis Woods, 1980. Newton and Descartes considered time a neutral product of relationships between energy and matter, or a condition essentially independent of them. Their time was a linear field of infinite extension, described by regular increments. Accordingly, their universe was not only eternal, but also of infinite measure. Einstein, however, conceived of a new time, one interdependent with the mechanics of motion and materiality. His is a time of transparency and elasticity, a subtle and complex interval and modulation, a forceful time, a forceful active time that colors and shapes events. His universe is a warp of finite duration and boundary, yet of infinite renewal and continuity. The form of the Einsteinian universe is related to the most ancient symbol of the cosmos. The circle, mandala, set in motion by time to create the epicycles of day, month, year, and millennium. As the mandala symbol presages the effect of relativity, so Einstein's thought bears into the modern world ancient wisdom regarding the unity of nature, the oneness of all things, his quest for a unified field theory was an attempt to give new meaning to the ancient dream of totality. In this way, he advanced beyond the boundaries of pure reason, bringing Western philosophy and science nearer to the synthetical realms of Pyth Pythagoras, Heraclitus, and the mystics of the Kabbalah. After his death, Einstein's body was cremated and scattered over the Atlantic Ocean. His tomb, if it is to house his remains, must not only honor his memory, but also embody his ideals. And next to this set of um, text, uh, Lebius Woods has drawn like a cruciform cross shape with several circles around it, showing that it's rotating in different directions and uh, intersected by uh, planes along the axes of the cross and then also um, inhabited or extended in various directions by a sort of urban-like composition of um, sculptural forms. Um, and the text continues, 
The tomb is a vessel journeying outward on a beam of light emitted from earth, following an immense and subtle arc through the stars. For eons it will inhabit the dominions of space until a distant time it must return to the world of its beginning. Thus, a cycle, the epicycle of space and time will close. On that remotest day, the dark corridors of the infinite will again become thresholds for departure, fading shores on the dark gulf of eternity. The form of the tomb has always been known. It exists as a sign in ancient codices on countless ritual maps of exploration. This vessel, this tomb, containing nothing, wandering on a random pulse of light, has always existed. Tomorrow, or the day after tomorrow, it will appear among the fixed and stable constellations of night. Even now it approaches from limitless possibility. All random journeys, all the immortal corridors, begin and end in the vaulted space of Earth's night, under the vagrant light of stars. The first part, like in the opening paragraph, he talks a lot about the Newton space, the Newton's concept of time versus Einstein's concept of time, right? So uh, I think there is a lot of, uh, so when we were studying this project, I think the first question was like, what were the differences in terms of time, right? And how uh, time and space, right? And how has science, the concept of science and all this uh, influence architecture, right? So uh, if we go through in the prehistoric time, I think, so we want to examine the relationship between science and architecture. So before Aristotle in the 6th to 5th uh, BC, uh, the concept or the vision of the universe is a flat earth. And then you move to Aristotle in the 300s uh, BC, and you start to they start to think of a spherical Earth, right? And I think around the same time, Pythagoras or Plato, they also mention a little bit about this flat, uh, this spherical Earth theory. And then finally, all the way to, uh, when you go to Ptolemy, which is around 100 to 170 AD, so they start, we start to have the idea of the Earth being the center of the universe. So this is a geocentric view of the world. Uh, and the drawing on the right is the depiction of the world uh, surrounded by different planets, right? And then the next step is the uh, Copernicus, right? Proposing the sun being the center of the universe and Earth is just orbiting around the sun. And then, uh, just slightly before that, there's the invention of the press, uh, Gutenberg press. So that, why that is important is because um, you can see the next stage, right, where you have uh, Galileo, Borromini, and Kepler. Uh, one in Galileo in Pisa, Borromini in Rome, and Kepler in Stuttgart. And then Copernicus, of course, in Poland. But all these ideas, they they know about all this idea because of the press, right? Before the invention of the press, uh, information doesn't spread so fast, right? So moving there, like going to Galileo and Kepler, they start to look at uh, elliptical orbits and they start to think about uh, kinet uh, kinematics, like moving things, or they have a uh, telescope, the invention of a telescope, right? So all of a sudden, is no longer just a theory, they are actually able to see all these planets and all this moving, right? So the Galileo and Kepler's, all this idea, they also kind of start to impact architecture because before Bormini, you can see like all the classical architecture, you have a perfect circle or a, a more like a fixed shape where there's not much movement like because the center is fixed and everything is kind of like definite, right? But when you have um, in Bormini San Carlo, for example, you start to have the double circle, but these two circles, they start to form an ellipse, right? And when you have double center, there's a lot of uh, movement is implied, right? So all, and then you have all this ellipse being the orbit and 
things like that, right? You can't you can't really say okay, this influence this, but the whole uh, awareness of the time is changing, is slowly changing, and science and architecture is definitely quite tied together. And then the next step we have the Newton's theory, right? So the three laws of Newton and how all these masses, the bigger you are, the bigger the gravity force, right? And is that's a definite center and it's based on attraction. So in uh, Newton's theory was invented in the 1600s to 1700s. And then you have Boulay in the building the Sanotka for Newton, right, in 1784. So from Newton's theory, then we move to uh, Einstein's general relativity theory, right, where there's no uh, gravitational force, but it's more like a space-time warp around. So all these objects, they move around a bigger mass because the whole time space is being warped by the bigger mass, right? So uh, because of all this theory and that's also the static universe and cosmological constant that Einstein talked about but abandoned in 1929. But it's pretty much what the biggest understanding of Einstein's theory is. And this we will elaborate a little bit more uh, later. But as for now, this is the uh, development of and the relationship between science and architecture that we can come. After Lebius is looking at the um, sciences, he makes a comparison to the sort of Einsteinian uh, ideas of the universe that's like flexible and subtle and elastic and the way that um, the space around things uh, is modulated. Uh, and he relates that to ancient uh, cultures and symbols, in particular to the mandala. And on the next page, he also... Um, then uh, talks about, in particular, a few uh, other philosophers like Pythagoras, Heraclitus, and the Kabbalah uh, in relationship to his unified uh, field theory, stating that the modern world and ancient wisdom regarding the unity of nature and the oneness of all things. So um, Woods is convinced that... Uh, Einstein is looking, or Einstein has a relationship to more ancient ideas. So I just want to kind of give you all something that Woods must have been looking at when he's developing this project would be um, these symbols of the mandala, particularly in the Hindu and the Buddhist um, versions. As you can see, they have a um, sort of connection between the cruciform and the circular, um, like, composition involved in them and they are generally like having these four gates on the top bottom um, left and right of the of the mandala that um, suggest uh, basically if when you look into it the point of the mandala is to uh, create a map of a unified mind so of the human and of the cosmos to suggest that at every single scale there's a unity of um, forces and maybe rules or laws and that there's an inner and outer synthesis of what's inside um, beings and out in the cosmos and that this um, mandala represents a symbol of all of those cosmic truths and at the center of the um, mandala is also like the abode or the house of the deity um, and so those four points on the, are gates towards a, a house, which is the like nature of the empty and enlightened mind in Buddhism, and it is like a tool to aid in their like meditation and trance. What's interesting is how well that correlates to the very simplest, simple and abstract form that Woods ends up taking out of it, which is like a cruciform that's like rotating through space. And then on the next slide, um, I've just kind of briefly given some images for um, Pythagoras, Heraclitus, and a bit about the Kabbalah, which he references, which I guess compared to the mandala, which is more from um, Eastern cultures, these references are a little bit are more from the Greek and then from 
the Western culture of um, uh, like sort of ancient Jewish um, uh, theology. So the some of the ancient Greeks basically have this understanding that the universe is mathematical. So that's like where I think Pythagoras and Einstein correlate in Woods' mind. Whereas Heraclitus in sp in especially was interested in cyclical stability. So they are very much trying to propose non-duality where you have the up and the down, a continual circular exchange of motion actually ends up creating stability. So um, that uh, that will also like come back to with uh, the epicycles and cycles that Woods is proposing for his project. But Heraclitus is definitely like one of the sources of inspiration for thinking about uh, this philosophical ter term of non-duality is like quite fascinating. And then um, the Kabbalah, which he references, has a paradox like at its center about the creation of um, of Earth and the universe, which is. And I have a uh, full disclaimer: I'm not like a, <laughs> a scholar of any of these things. We've just been researching this for this project, so um, my understanding is that in the Kabbalah there's an idea of the withdrawal of God to make an empty space in order for creation to appear. So the relationship between like void and creation and the beginning of creation requiring a, um, an action of withdrawal is quite fascinating in relationship to um, the, both the Mandala idea, which also has the idea of the empty mind at its center, and Lebius's cruciform, which also ends up being void at its center. Apparently, since 16 years old, Einstein has been wondering what it would be like riding on a beam of light, and right then, so and then the launch, of course. So the three uh, planets light up: the sun, the moon, and the earth. So uh, to me, I don't know. I read it as a tribute to Newton. So you start from where Newton ended, right? Where this tree, the gravitational force is lined up at all strongest, and then uh, Einstein's to appear or is launched. Uh, yeah, so I think he's more interested in um, uh, things like that, like day and night, the cycle of uh, day and night, and uh, the idea of uh, epicycle, where uh, this movement. There's also quite many orbits around the big orbits, right? And all this is like, this is, this defines day, night, um, spring, summer, autumn, and winter. Right? So, I, the other thing that we look at is like, there's this figures that's sitting on the, or protruding from the cross. And, Maybe, yeah, so um, we're kind of like wondering why is Lebius putting these like urban forms on t just two of the um, like extrusions of the cross like axis? Why aren't they on all four sides or why isn't it just on one side? Um, what's going on with this um, architecture that he's created and what are these objects there? So he does reference them later in his blog as being kind of city-like. And um, what we began to see in them was basically this, um, uh, also a correlation to some of the drawings he was making to day and night. So uh, in, the, in the previous slide, he also has two drawings, one um, where the... Uh, sculptures and the urban life form on top of the cruciform is lit up by um, and is a little bit more is rendered as if the sun is shining on it and then the other one is rendered as if it's in in darkness um, and so I think like his interest in non-duality and the fact that life ex only exists because death exists which is a sort of representation on the right hand side of this slide where um, in order for there to be um, summer, there must be also uh, winter, and in order for there to be um, all of these dualistic 
aspects of our world. Um, they require each other and their transitions and their gradients um, all to exist together. So the world is like inherently paradoxical and like moving in transition between um, these these phases. So I think that's like where we came with. An oh, and then we move on to the, the shape of the tomb. And I mean, he talks about here as as a sign, but is is it a cross or is it two minuses, right? So I think there are a few ways that we can read the, the sign or this the symbol of a cross, which is quite loaded because uh, there is the uh, true, true history, right? So it's always a very symbolic symbol. Right. So he says, uh, you can see in the bottom where it's underlined in this text from his blog, that it's not a religious symbol, but instead uh, it's more a plus sign that's formed by the intersection of two minus signs. So if you think of a, a plus, that's one thing, but if you take two minus, si uh, minus signs as an empty emptying idea and another emptying idea, then at the center of that would be a massless idea or the void. Um, so he, the only way for something to be as fast as the, as the speed of light, according to Einsteinian theory, would also require it to be massless. Um, so there's a, a paradox in what Lebius suggests here, which seems like a built thing, but it would have to have zero, zero mass in order to be moving at the speed of light as well. And this idea of the cross, like, uh, very much relates to some of the beginning ideas of architecture for urban planning in, uh, like, the Roman Roman city uh, ideas. So probably some of you guys have come across the idea of the Cardo and Decumanus as the planning uh, tools for Roman um, uh, military bases, but also Roman cities. So all over Europe, most cities have some central cross which defines a grid and close to the central cross will be a void um, like the forum um, or in our case with Einstein's tomb you have the cross and the void at the center which would be a sort of forum um, out of which um, the tomb of the uh, Einstein tomb is uh, based. And then there's a few more symbols I guess we wanted to bring up um, that relate to this entire investigation the, um, some of those urban like uh, extensions on the on the cruciform are kind of reminiscent to the decorations on top of gates. So that also has a wider metaphor to the mandala gates. And in that uh, like set of um, sculptures, there seem to be even figures that look like um, that look like horses or even a Pegasus which then would relate back to some of the Greek references that um, Woods brought up because the Pegasus in Greek mythology was instructed by Zeus to bring lightning um, and thunder from Olympus. Um, so there's actually quite a few more like layers where um, Woods is trying to bring different symbols together towards the like memorialization of Einstein. So, uh, yeah, I think, yeah, we are, so I think we're coming in to, the, to the end of the analysis, but I think basically it's, uh, the, the project is a lot about space, time, and light, and that is quite uh, surprising because, uh, not surprising, but I think that's the, the, the three things that really brought science and architecture together, right? The fundamentally, architecture and science, they are both about space, time, and light. And, uh, and then for this project, at first, I don't know, I thought it's a, it's a really conceptual project and abstract, but again, when we look at it, there are like all these figures and symbols, right, that uh, they are quite loaded and not very easy symbols, right? And then, so, in that sense, it's quite fascinating. Maybe I have one question. So, 
Yeah, I'm just wondering sure. because both of you have done, obviously have taken a lot of time going through this and have studied it for quite a long time. I was wondering, what have you learned from this, from the analysis of the business work that you have managed to use in your own practice? How has it affected the way you practice? And then that's what I'm wondering. Is to keep me from being too practical because when you practice, everything, most of your task is problem solving, and that is really not the full potential of architecture. So, uh, this project taught me how to question with a project instead of trying to provide a solution, right? And then it's, it's also highly conceptual, right? So, how far can we imagine and think, right? And then, uh, I mean, it's, it's free and you choose I'm fine, right? The tomb doesn't, he didn't build a tomb that's like on earth and it's meant to be built, right? So this is quite, so not in terms of, obviously I, my takeaway is not from the information or things like that. I mean, I learned a lot about science. <laughs> Like a lot more because we were like it really we took a long time to decipher why why lie and what is a what which part of it is is the is the science right how but then you know and then we went one big round and then only to conclude that maybe would uh, would didn't care too much about science right but <laughs> yeah but uh, so it's it's a very important project that. Architecture project can be like that. It can be about ideas. It can be about concept, right? That that is it's not just uh, I don't know mortar and concrete and practicality, right? That I think a lot of architects can do, but not every architect can imagine and dream, right? So if you want, this is like the the scientist in in science where you have blue sky experiment, there are experiments that solve problems like, oh, can we have a more efficient uh, air common and things like that, right? But they are, they are just science, scientists that ask questions like, why is the sky blue, right? So it's not immediately applicable. It's like, why do we want to go to the moon? Why do we want to go to Mars? Though we have enough problems on Earth already, right? So these are, why do we want to have another uh, telescope in the world, uh, in the space, right? We have really, we have Hubble and then now we have JW uh, telescope, right? Why do you want to know? So, I think it's quite hard, especially in Singapore, right? It's like when everything is so practical. So, it's a bit, this, this project always reminds me that there's this best potential for architecture, right? That is about thoughts and ideals. Yeah. I mean, I think, for me, it's similar, like, if architecture can has the capacity to be an art form that can either manifest our, like, what's happening in our current era, like, to ask yourself or ask myself, what what is the, like, current experience of life? What is that ideology? What is that, um, like, political stance? Or, like, what is necessary to respond to what's going on in the world right now? Or, like, how can I be discursive with questions from the outside? So what, like, it's really fun about this project is when Einstein asks, like, when he's 16, what would it be like to ride a beam of light? And Woods is able to respond with an architecture. Okay, in order to ride a beam of light, you need a massless um, architecture. Like, and I'm going to give you a massless architecture as, your, as the monument to your life. Um, and how what would what would a massless architecture need? And then he looks into like all of the architectural and philosophical ideas of like mass and emptiness, and finds the mandala and finds these non-dualistic ideas that like begin to layer up all of these answers to Einstein's question of like what would it mean to ride a beam of light? Um, and I think that 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 dialogistic method for architecture is really productive because it creates unknown spaces that, um, yeah, give you, give you a, a new sense of what architecture can do. Yep. 
so I think yeah so I think we both agree like to do this project as the first project because it's really not so uh, clear cut like not a practical practical project but very fascinating project right